Hey guys, welcome back to episode 129 of the Answer Podcast. We discuss anything related to the Second Amendment, including firearms, gear, and current events. I'm your host, Jacob Clifford, and I'm co-host, Jerry Mitchell. Today we're, today we're going to be talking about the Second Amendment Supreme Court case, federal gun control, New Hampshire pro-gun bills. And uh, yeah, as always, we'll start off with some personal news, which I have none of. I don't think Jared does either. We, yeah. I, I actually ended up ordering a uh, Surefire three-prong, sort of non-war comp. I'm going to throw that on my 11.5, and that's more of a dedicated suppressor host. So I want a non-war comp because the suppressor is more effective without the war comp. So I have yet to receive that, but it should be in this coming week, and then I'll get that mounted right up. Nice. But fun, fun. Yeah, I haven't mounted the uh, that what close time yeah. that I bought off of Mike, but I will at some point one of these days. So... When I get around to it, but um, yeah. So, anyways, I suppose we can uh, begin with the the meat and potatoes of the episode. Yeah. So the the big thing, um, it's kind of going to be a news episode. So the uh, the biggest thing that happened is the uh, federal Supreme Court uh, made a ruling in the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association case versus, would you say, that Bruin? Um. So. Yeah. It's, Essentially, a, a court case that went up to the Supreme Court. The main part of it was arguing uh, that about like how New York, uh, <clears throat> New York um, City people have to go about getting concealed carry permits. So technically, in a lot of these anti-gun places, they are allowed to get permits, but they have what's called uh, proper cause that they have to justify. And typically, that's only granted to people that are in private security, uh, celebrities, wealthy people. Occasionally, you can get an exemption for maybe you work for a bank and you're responsible for moving around a lot, lots of money from one location to another. Potentially, you could get a proper cause exemption for that. Uh, maybe if there's a credible threat against your life. Um, but I know like Tulsi Gabbard, for example, she has a example because she's from Hawaii. Uh, she had a credible threat against her life from an individual that didn't like her, and she was unable to get a concealed carry permit in Hawaii, yeah. even though somebody threatened to kill her. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So a lot of these things go to the extreme. So this is states, uh, like certain counties in uh, California, New York City, I, I would imagine other parts of New York State as well, um, Chicago, uh, there's a lot of places, Washington, D.C. is a great example as well. All these places that require very strict guidelines as to who gets a concealed carry permit. And at that point, like, it's just totally not even justifying the, the means. Um, yeah. So it was a 6-3 decision by the Supreme Court in favor. Um, so they ultimately held that uh, New York's proper cause violated the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment is equal protection under the law. And that it prevents law-abiding citizens from law-abiding citizens with ordinary self-defense needs from exercising their right to keep and bear arms. So the average person that goes and tries to apply for one of these, even though they might show under some some version of what you would define proper cause as, they might might say, I need, I need it for self-defense because X, Y, or Z. So because of how strict New York is on this, uh, they're in violation of this new decision. So, ultimately, um, it's a two-way case, and they're extending it to the 14th Amendment as well, which is nice to see because a lot of these gun laws don't apply to people across the board. We've talked about it before. Either the, the racist history of gun control or um, it turns into, like, a, a poor tax. So, you look at the NFA, for, for instance. Um, when it initially was adopted... Um, like suppressors were barely over two hundred dollars, and then you throw a two hundred dollar tax stamp on it. So really, at that point, only wealthy people can afford yeah. it. The only reason we're able to afford those items nowadays is because of inflation. Because the obnoxious amount of inflation. Yes. Yeah. So now two hundred dollars is just pissing money. Yes. Yeah. So I I like to see this um, because the Fourteenth Amendment argument could be applied to. We'll get into it later, but some federal gun control that that has been passed. Um, and signed by the president at this point. So, uh, 
Thomas Clarence wrote the, uh, the opinion in favor of this decision. <coughs> and he wrote that individuals have the right to keep, um, which he interpreted as own, and bear, which he interpreted <coughs> as carry. And that applies to arms, which is very cool because they reaffirm that the Second Amendment is an individual right. Because under the Heller decision that we've talked about before, uh, which was uh, Dick Heller sued uh, Washington, D.C. because they would not allow him to actually carry a gun. So the Supreme Court in 2010 did rule that you have the right to carry a gun. Um, but now this is expanding it to, I guess, who's allowed to get a gun. And the government can't just tell you no if, if they come up with some arbitrary way of proving that you need to carry that gun. Yeah. Uh, so very cool. So it's um, under Heller. The downside to Heller, though, is that they kind of ruled the Second Amendment was a uh, collective right. So one yeah. that people held. Uh, and that's kind of like the, the militia argument to the Second Amendment, where a group of people are allowed to carry guns for the purpose of, you could argue, defending your community. Or if you really want to go extreme with some interpretations of the Second Amendment, it'd be like National Guard. Yeah. The Supreme Court's gone back to individual rights. Now, you on the individual level have the ability to keep your firearms and bear them. Um, and then Thomas went on to write that the, the arms that you do carry do not apply to those that were around in the 18th century, so the 1700s, which is huge. Because we hear that argument all the time, even though it makes zero sense, because um, he even wrote this in his opinion that the First Amendment does not apply to just uh, newspapers or print press. It applies to social media, it applies to news, uh, through the TV, it applies to all those different platforms that we have nowadays, social media, uh, sort of. <laughs> yeah. Um, nowadays it's kind of hit or miss with social media, but ultimately you have your First Amendment that applies to technology. He also referenced the Fourth Amendment. Uh, this is true that you still have privacy in your phones. Law enforcement have to get search warrants to search your phone. I guess unless you're the NSA or something, but yeah, that, I mean, Mo they, local government. If you know about it, they have to get a warrant. Yes, you know, yeah, local governments, um, small agencies, all that stuff. They still have to get search warrants for your phone. They can't just plug it in and download all the information off of it. Um, you know, it doesn't apply just to the papers you keep in your house. So, by extension, modern firearms apply under this. Which is, this is this might be the biggest part of this um, because. It applies to um, AR-15s. It's not just muskets. Yeah. It applies to Glocks, not just flintlock pistols. So very, very good to see. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so the, the they also went on to explain the bear part of this. Uh, so interpreting bear as to carry firearms with modern language. So that applies to um, outside your home. Is how the justices interpreted this because they they said that a majority of people are not going to bear arms inside their homes it's not really reasonable most people are comfortable in their homes and they're not like just walking around their their uh the insides of their homes toting firearms weird yeah so the average uh well yeah i mean i still can still carry at home just yeah, yeah i'm yeah. not necessarily taking off every time I step in my door. No, exactly. But, yeah. No, it makes perfect sense. Most people are, yeah. you know. So if most people are going to strap on a handgun, it's going to be out in public. Yeah. Which logically makes sense. That's where you're trying to defend yourself because you're more comfortable in your home, generally more secure in your home, all yeah. those kind of things. So there's multiple avenues to this. Great to see. It's a huge, huge win for the Second Amendment. Yeah, it really is. Um, Like in a in a perfect world, like we've talked about, we wouldn't even need the Supreme Court to rule on this because I was kind of thinking about this. It's more of a self defense case, um, and a more of a self defense justification for the Second Amendment, which we know is true. But in the same breath, we also know the Second Amendment applies to more than just you individually defending yourself or your family or your property. Yeah, it goes beyond. It goes up and up to and including defense of your country. Um, against, you know, domestic, uh, tyrannical governments, foreign governments, all that kind of stuff, which maybe eventually we'll get something like that. But for the time being, we can't, we can't turn our noses up at this. No, not at all. Cause this, this is just great to see. Yeah. 
So uh, there are other lawsuits that pro-gun agent or um, organizations plan on doing related to this case because it does it does leave some things up to interpretation. Uh, like Coleon Noir did a video on this where he believes that New York is, I, I think the mayor kind of um, touched on this a little bit in a, in a press conference. She plans on expanding the places that you're not allowed to carry handguns in the state of New York now. Mm. So those sensitive, defined as sensitive places. Because the Supreme Court did not rule that you have a right to carry a gun everywhere. They ruled that you have a right to carry a gun in public. So they're already kind of a, a way. There's already like a loophole. around it. Yeah. So, um, so if New York says you can't carry guns in grocery stores, for instance, um, I think specifically the government or the, the governor referenced churches and schools, uh, which schools I think have already been a thing for a while for a lot of states. Um, but I don't know why churches. I don't know why. I was church, wondering if they're like, eventually going to try to be like, oh, if the you know, kind of like how they did with COVID, where like fire capacity, like if it's if the fire capacity is over this amount, it's a high populated area, yeah. and you're not going to be able to carry or something yeah. something down that kind of path. Wouldn't so, surprise me. So in New York State, you might see okay, I can carry it in Times Square. I can carry a handgun now concealed in Times Square, but I can't enter any businesses. Yeah, I, obviously you can, but there there's probably going to be pretty stringent consequences if you get caught with a firearm in these places. Yeah, like in in New Hampshire, it's even if you go into like a store that has a no guns allowed and you get found out with a gun they tell you to leave if you don't leave then it becomes a trespassing issue but it's not a gun issue yeah like, All right. Fair but enough. in new york it could be it it could oh. go to some extreme level in new oh, york yeah. i feel like yeah. i was hearing this story of a guy i think it was yesterday i was listening to this documentary it was on a side note he uh he got caught carrying a firearm on the streets in la he got two years in prison They're like yep like right off the bat and i think that has to do with the mandatory minimum as well yeah. Over there, it's absolutely insane. So the interesting thing about this is it applied to generally major cities or the ones that have these these uh, limitations on the um, carry permits and the Second Amendment. Um, so kind of a couple different things is the Supreme Court didn't rule that concealed carry permits are unconstitutional. So you can still have a concealed carry permit, but you no longer have this like two-step process of figuring out who is proper to get one of these who shows proper cause. So I think what you're going to see is a lot of states are now going to become a <coughs> shell issue that are now a May issue. So, which is still good for people in these states. So that'd be like Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, California, New York, all those kind of places we talked about, Illinois. I guess a quarter of the U.S.'s population are in a lot of those metropolitan areas. So uh, Chicago, New York City, L.A. Boston. Boston, yeah. Um, that's where most of the U.S. pop, or I guess, high concentrated uh, population centers. So a quarter of the U.S. population is actually there. So this does open up the Second Amendment to a lot more people, which yeah. is which is great. Most definitely. Hopefully, we see something come come out of this as far as like uh, national reciprocity, because if carry permits are now shall issue in every state. When it makes sense to have either like a national, rec either have states recognize each other's across the board, or have some sort of national reciprocity, or best case scenario would just be national uh, constitutional carry. Yeah, the only thing I can see foresee happening is because say states like this are going to try to require some kind of class you have to take to yeah. acquire it, that they're not going to have the reciprocity. Well, if, if they could. Yeah, I, I mean, it's still probably going to be nuanced like it is now, unfortunately, where California might require eight hours of training and then New York State might require 10 hours of training. Yeah. It'd be nice, though, if there was like a minimum amount that would cover every state. So you could just like take a class yeah. for a day or two. And I then be I believe there was a program. I remember Grand Thumb pushed it. For like 30 something states. Yeah, yeah. So there might, I'm hoping that something, I don't know, maybe that bumps up to 45 states now or something. It'd yeah. be nice just to have something that would. You could fall back on at least. Yeah, um, most definitely. Yeah, because ultimately, that, in my opinion, you're ultimately doing this for like insurance purposes. You're doing this for worst case scenario. I have to use my gun because if you're concealed carrying properly, you shouldn't really get found out unless you have like a law enforcement encounter where they have to go hands on with you. Yeah, but so, again, you're probably doing something wrong. Yes, you know. Uh, I mean, you, you could get caught up in a bad situation, but 
Yeah, it's fair. You know what I mean? Or, you know, you might have a medical emergency. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the only other big thing. It's like a medical emergency, they take you in, you know, the hospital or they, you know, or something of the such, you know what I mean? Then they find a firearm on you and that could, that could be shitty. You know, so if you have a heart attack for your gun in the woods, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, ah! And just, you know, you're yeah. a little... Well, it depends flick. on what state you're in, I guess, but... It's like, fair. But if you have that concealed carry permit that's now maybe there's reciprocity in 40-something states, you have a higher likelihood of that actually going into your favor. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, you have, you have a higher likelihood of you, you know, having a medical emergency in a state that might not try to penalize you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully something comes out of that. We'll, we'll see. Um, because on a federal level... Uh, they're definitely after gun control. So, yeah. like we touched on, I think a couple podcasts ago now. Uh, I think it was not the last one, the one before that. So, um, 15 Republicans ended up getting on board with gun control. And they included from states like Maine. There's a Republican senator from Maine. Even Alaska. Uh, obviously, like Mitt Romney from Utah. There's a bunch of random Republicans that jumped on the gun control bandwagon. So they had secret talks with the Senate, um, like Democratic members of the Senate, and they pretty much agreed to, we're going to pass gun control, and these are this is what we're going to pass. Uh, so they, they did it in a very shady backdoor way, and they did this on purpose, because they knew if they did their typical process of drafting up a bill, having that like public session on it, having everybody get their like three to five minutes to talk, like get actual senators there three to five minutes to talk about it, then general public would find out about this and they'd be infuriated and they'd probably uh, raise holy hell with their senators and then this might not go through. So actually what they ended up doing, which this is really shitty, but they took a bill um, that was already passed by the Senate and it was um, drafted by Senator Marco Rubio from Florida. And it was something about like a federal courthouse in Florida. So they took that already passed bill stripped the language out of it and added all this gun control stuff to it. Jesus. And because it was already passed, they had to just, do, they just had to raise it again. They didn't even have to go over it. They just had to raise it again and be like, okay, senators, do you agree on this? And then you ended up having like the 65 yeses and the, the rest were no's out of a hundred. So then because it was already something, um, so it already passed by the Senate. So they sent it to the house and the house is like, yep, they vote on it real quick. And then it goes to the president's desk. That's why this all happened within like, two weeks yeah i was gonna say it was very quick versus the typical bill process is a while it takes like a month or more um so they really did some shady backdoor politics for this because they didn't want you know all the lobby lobbyists in there talking to everybody it's very unfortunate um but it shows you the federal agenda for these people regardless of the party lines we've talked about it before um you know, it seems like a lot of the gun control that actually ends up getting passed or allowed to go through happens on the Republicans' watch, and this is definitely the case. Yeah. Not that Republicans are in power right now, but they allowed this to happen. Yeah, 100%. So, the main uh, points here, enhanced background checks. So, that's going to be for under 21. Because of the Uvalde shooting, the shooter was 18. So now the government thinks that by enhancing these background checks, they would have prevented that individual from getting that firearm. Big hang up with the enhanced background checks is if these juveniles, uh, well, if these adults now that have juvenile records, that's what they're hoping to catch is maybe they had assaults as a juvenile. Maybe they had, maybe they had felony level stuff. Maybe there's some um, documents they can get in there about like animal abuse or something that might lead them to be like to have a high likelihood of being a serial killer. Um, so instead of the, with federal uh, background checks now, there's like a three day maximum. So like if Nix doesn't come back in three days and you get to have your firearm. Okay, yeah. Are you familiar with that? Um, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, so they're changing that to seven days now yeah. for the under, under 21. Nice. So I guess Nix has up to seven days to give you a result um, by Supposedly being able to access your, your juvenile records now, which in the state of New Hampshire, those get sealed once you're an adult. So I don't know exactly how they're going to access those things. But um, yeah, the, the big, the big hang up here though, is it doesn't matter how good your background uh, check system is if the people don't have a background. So yeah, if the individual applying for this firearm doesn't have a criminal background at all or a mental health background or anything, 
how are they going to be a prohibited person under this background system? Yeah, exactly. Like, a lot of these, I shouldn't say a lot of these, but these 18 year old shooters, they haven't had the the time as an adult to really be able to commit these crimes. They're, yeah. they're 18. And I think that's their, like, just to play the devil's advocate on it, not that I support it, but that's their, I think, their theory on the juvenile records kind yeah. of stipulation. It's like, well, being that, you know, some of these people might have had run ins with the law as youth, you know, um, maybe we can catch them a little bit better, you know, is, is the theory on it. I can see, I can see where they're coming from and where it can sound good. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I, I see what they're going for, you know. Um, so what I brought up earlier with the 14th Amendment is I think this would be a perfect lawsuit for the 14th Amendment. Um, you have an 18-year-old that gets denied his right to buy a semi-automatic rifle. Potentially, there's a lawsuit opportunity there for him under the 14th Amendment because, okay, a 21-year-old can just easily go in and buy a rifle, but me at 18, I can't. Even better yet, if this individual's like in the military, uh, or even law enforcement, because uh, in the state of New Hampshire, you can be a certified part-time law enforcement agent at 18. Uh, you have to be full-time at 21, but military, you can go overseas and fight for your country and potentially die at 18 carrying a rifle, but you can't own one back at home. I always thought the same thing with handguns. Yeah, it was always so stupid. Like, I was issued a Glock at, <coughs> was like 21 or, I mean, I'm at 20 or 21 at the time, but I was like just barely the, the legal age to own a handgun on my own, but I was like, Overseas carrying one. Yeah, that's like, how I was at 18. I had, yeah, exactly. I had You're not. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. <coughs> um, yeah, so that'll be really interesting, and I'm sure they could try to bring up the, the counter argument of like tobacco sales or something like that. And like, well, you're not ready. You're under 21. It's like. Well, tobacco's 21 now, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so. I, I wonder if there's going to come a point where we're going to shift the age of adulthood completely to 21, one piece at a time. Like voting? Voting, driving. Enlist, enlisting, maybe driving. I don't know about driving because it's 16, you know what I mean? Yeah. With, might, maybe it'll be, it'll turn into 18 with driver's ed and 21 on your own, you know, yeah. like they have with 16 and 18 now. I just wonder if we're going to slowly... I don't know if maturity's not happening as fast or what. Like, and I think some of it's just a bunch of bullshit, you know, that they're just trying to pass. But like, I'm wondering if we're gonna see, you know, the um, the legal age of like adulthood um, start to creep up to 21 and a lot of other facets yeah. of life. The the problem is really not everybody matures at the same rate. No, and that's kind of the problem with a lot of this stuff. Like, like you can't even rent a car till you're like 25, and that's because they yeah. know if you're under 25, you have a high likelihood of getting in an accident. Yeah, and most of them, if you are, if you're, like, between 21 and 25, um, you'll get just hammered on when it comes to, yeah. like, extra fees and stuff. There's even, like, even renting a hotel room. They're, like, really weird about, like, if you're under a certain age, renting a hotel room. Like, they just make it more yes. difficult. Yep. And because I, people, like, obviously, the reason people do this is because people have ruined it. Like, uh, there's obviously been idiots that have ruined it for everybody else, but... You're creating a second-class citizen, really, at that point. Um, because if they're not going to be in school, like, college isn't mandated. So if they're going to be able to live on their own at 18, but they're not able to defend themselves at 18, like, what are we really doing? Because you can get married and have a kid at 18. You have a family to potentially defend, but you can't even own the firearms <coughs> now uh, to defend those people. Yeah, it's really messed up. You yeah. know, because again, and a lot of people said that about like other stuff, you know, oh, you have to be, like we said, you have to be 21 to buy a handgun, but you can go enlist at 18 or you have to be, you know, you can have a cigarette and a beer okay. at 21, yeah, but you drinking can enlist thing. at 18, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think the, the drinking thing, like at one point in time, like was it the 60s or 70s, drinking was 18? It wasn't that, I don't even know if it was that long ago, no. depending on state, it was on a state level. Oh, yeah. Um, I know, I think it was Vermont used to be. 18 and New Hampshire was 21 mm -hmm. like and then there was a time where New Hampshire was 18 as well and yeah. like yeah it's a, it's just crazy because we're always bouncing forth between these de definitions of like what's adulthood well you see this now with nicotine um, yeah like cigarettes and, and now didn't they just outlaw jewels yes like apparently like they're outlawing jewels and sh shit like that like which is just like because they're trying to say they're like marketed at kids and stuff which I mean Okay. That's a whole another topic is the whole like vape thing. Um, yeah, I think it's more money within big tobacco. Yes, but, I agree. You know. um, 
And that's the problem. Is like, when you outlaw something, you look at Prohibition back in the uh, late teens, early like 1920s. Um, people were just found more dangerous ways to consume their their addictions. So like moonshine became a huge thing. Oh yeah. And and like Working around good whiskey. You know what I, like you can even argue that like alcohol is far more detrimental to your body than say like marijuana or something. Like alcohol is one of those things where if you get addicted to it, like you can die. Um if you don't get it. So it's just one of those things where people, if they can't get it the legal way, they're going to find a illegal, potentially more harmful way of doing what they need to do. Yeah. That's well, kind of the whole, the whole thing about governments, you know, passing laws on things. And the result, like, is them getting into trouble with the law and just getting yes. into fights and causing violence that would have never happened in the first place. You know, I'm not saying people are going to go to war over jewels, but, like, you know. Well, uh, even in New Hampshire, like, a few years ago, like, 10, 10 15 years ago, it was a really big deal for... Uh, minors to have cigarettes. Like, that was like a big deal. Yeah. It was, it was like it? confiscate the cigarettes and like give them this this ticket to go show up in court. It was, it was almost like um, an underage drinker. Like an MIP. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of funny. It's, it's kind of funny how things change. And, and then you even look at New York. I forgot what the guy's... Was it Gardner? They had the case with that guy that was um, illegal, illegally selling individual cigarettes on the street corner. Do you remember that? Jesus, I think I do. He was like a heavier, sad, overweight guy. Um, and the cops go and interact with him, and he ends up resisting and ends up dying as a result because I think he ended up having like a heart attack during the struggle or something. Oh, yes, yes. So yeah. it was it was one of those things like, why are we even bothering enforcing these laws, like selling individual cigarettes on the street corner? Like, well, then that's the really thing is the government really just cares like deep down about it getting its cut. You know, because it's like, yeah. oh, well, you only pay taxes on the pack. Now you're selling them individually. You yeah. know what I mean? And like, oh, you're making your money back that yeah. we've taxed from you. Yeah. It's the same thing with off-road diesel. It's the same thing. Off-road diesel is the same as heating oil and yeah. regular on-road highway diesel. It's all ultra-low sulfur. And yet here we are, like, finding people like five, six, seven, eight, twenty-five thousand grand, depending on how much fuel they have on board, um, if they have the wrong colored diesel. Because it's not taxed as harshly. Like, it's blows your mind, you know? Yeah. But again, it just goes back to showing the government really just cares about getting its cut. Yeah. Other than that, they don't care about you. Yeah. You know? Uh, the next one, red flag gun laws. So this federal gun control is giving funding for states to enact their own red flag gun laws. Um, I, I explained this one kind of on our last podcast where we were talking about the proposed gun control. And... The feds really have to rely on local governments to enact this stuff, or at least state governments to enact it, and then local courts to follow through with it, because there's no federal way they can enact red flag gun laws. There's not enough federal judges, and I don't think the federal court systems even have the capacity to get bogged down with all these potential complaints of people that should not have firearms. But it, this is a, a gross infringement on not just your Second Amendment rights, but your right to due process. Um, it's just like um just like domestic violence protection orders in the state of new hampshire if somebody goes and they provide a petition to the, um, the local court that judge makes mostly a usually it's a same day decision on whether or not you are going to have rights to your firearms your property all that kind of stuff just based on a single petition that you don't get to defend yourself in um and based on some, have you seen, I don't know if you probably didn't see them, the, uh, the infographics that went around the internet. Mm, I don't know if I have. It was kind of like, it showed like a picture of a person. It was like, oh, this person um, suspects you of like um, doing something illegal with your firearms or displaying them pr improperly or something. So then they go to the government and petition a red flag gun law against you. Yeah. And then the, the judge decides it and then they have local law enforcement go and take your guns and then Ooh. it's the same thing with a domestic violence protection orders you go you petition the court if it gets granted then the judge well the court sends it to the judge would sign off on it and supposedly that's due process under our current system for the time being until you have a court date in like 15 to 30 days and then goes to the local local agency where that person lives they go serve it and if there's the box check to ask people if they have deadly weapons then you have to ask them, and then you have to seize those until they're court date. At which point, then you get the chance to defend yourself. 
So it's going to be a very similar system if red flag gun laws get enacted. Um, and their thinking, their thinking is that these laws could potentially stop like the Buffalo shooting, the Uvalde shooting, even though New York State has red flag gun laws of their own. Yeah. And they did nothing to stop that shooting. Hmm. So I, th I think this is a potential big one because um, states that are looking at these laws and don't have the proper funding for them might end up jumping, jumping on the bandwagon. Um, you see that a lot with um, like federal funding for schools and stuff. Everybody wants to stay compliant because they want that federal money. Um, and some of that is because that money gets abused or goes, goes to other other things it's not supposed to and that, that whole governmentism thing, but um, I, I this one potentially is going to get highly abused depending on how it goes about. I don't foresee under the way our state's going right now that we would enact our own red flag gun laws, but I don't, <laughs> you never know. Yeah, you never, you really don't. Um, so the, uh, the next one, private sales. So they're kind of expanding the FFL definitions here. So it's no longer somebody that makes like a livelihood and profit on firearms that would require that be required to have an FFL. Now it's people that just make profit. So potentially, if you um, if you make money selling a gun, you might need an FFL license now to sell that thing. Yeah, or at least go through an FFL to sell your private property. Um, I'm sure this one's going to be interpreted by the ATF. We'll probably hear more about that one. Yeah. Because this, this one could also get pretty um, pretty abused, depending on how it gets interpreted. Oh, most definitely. Um, expanded misdemeanor exemptions. Uh, so they're expanding what's considered a domestic violence charge on the 4473. For anybody that's you know done a 4473, if you've been charged and convicted of a domestic violence crime, typically you're exempt from owning a firearm until you... Uh, work to get that off your record. So they're expanding it to intimate partners that um, it previously was just cohabitated or had kids. Now I guess they're expanding it to just intimate partners. So people that could be separated, don't have kids, but one's abusing the other and gets charged and convicted. So I don't know. I don't know if that one, I don't know how that's going to play out. It doesn't seem, yeah. it just seems kind of like they're changing the words on it, but yeah, it's like they're just trying to kind of tack one thing on little by little. You yeah, know what I mean? which is typically how this gun control kind of stuff goes. Yeah, most definitely. Um, and the last one is um, they're expanding. I guess they're, there's now going to be federal repercussions for certain firearm transfers and straw purchases. Even though, like, I believe straw purchases are federally illegal because... You have to swear on the 4473 that you're not buying this for another person. Yeah. But now there's like harsher consequences, apparently, if you're buying this firearm for somebody else, which, again, I don't really know how they... It, it's, like Jake said, it's kind of that inch. Yeah. <laughs> They're taking so, an inch at a time until they have a mile. That's the thing. And it's like, but the thing is, like, it's not illegal to get. You no, and I mean? that's that's my point, is that it, you, can, you can legally walk into a gun store, buy a gun for you, decide, oh, I don't want this anymore, and then gift that away. Yeah. It, I don't know, again, like, like that's how in the glaring kind of holes in all this are just something else. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, yeah. great. You, you know, you made, you made it harder to, you know, do straw purchases. Yeah. It's like, well, it's, it's the same thing when you go back to the enhanced background checks for under 21. It's like if in the state of New Hampshire, I, there's not even an age limit or an age minimum, I should say, I guess, for, um, Conceal carry permits. And we do have constitutional carry now, so uh, somebody might say 16 because of the hunter uh, hunter safety stuff, but yep. there's not really, there's to my knowledge, there's no age limit that's like, you can only conceal carry a handgun from this age on. Yeah. So how you get around that is because you're not able to go buy one. So uh, your grandfather, your father, your family member, your uncle, somebody gifts you a handgun and then you just start conceal carry. I, I had to do that. Like, uh, well, actually... I, I think I had to do that because, so w at least patents, they wouldn't, um, when I went to go buy my, my uh, Gen 1 Smith & Wesson Shield, yeah. I had a paper license and he wouldn't accept that. Yeah, of course. So I wasn't able to purchase that handgun because I didn't have a, 
a permanent license. Which I don't know if that's like a, I don't know if that's just a him thing. <laughs> yeah, it might be, you know. Because I had a valid license, it just wasn't the permanent copy, so. Yeah, that's kind of annoying, you know. Hmm. Um, and then if you want to bring up those uh, yeah. those New Hampshire pro-gun bills. So. so we had a handful of New Hampshire pro-gun bills go through. I, I don't even, I didn't even hear about these till they passed. Uh, yeah, typically, it's pretty gosh darn cool. It's pretty cool, because typically we hear some scuttlebutt about pro-gun and anti-gun bills coming forward. Uh, maybe it's because it's not typically this time of year when this stuff goes through. I think it's normally earlier in the year. Yeah. Like more like um, late, late winter or early spring. Yeah. So I don't know if these are just things that maybe passed the House and the Senate and we're waiting on the governor's signature and then he finally got around finally to signing. Around that might have been it. Some signing, yeah. So uh, the first things first is um, New Hampshire now has 100% true constitutional carry, if you will. So you can now carry a gun on a snowmobile and an ATV in New Hampshire um, if you weren't already. Um, Again, we talked about it prior to the podcast. It's one of those things where um, I don't know if this was just an interpretation or people thought that maybe you could get jammed up for this. Yeah, it's one of those things where like a uh, fishing game law essentially was conflicted. You know it might mean? be, yeah. And what well, we thought, at least, it's like, weird. This a case on this didn't go to court, like the state court, so we don't know. I'm I'm fairly certain that you could have argued yourself as under cost social care, I have the right to carry this, regardless of this other law. But yeah, who knows? It's it's good, obviously, that it's passed. Yeah, one hundred percent. And um, he also, the governor also signed House Bill one one seven eight into law, which is an act prohibiting the state from enforcing any federal statute, <clears throat> regulation, or presidential executive order that restricts or regulates the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Um, and the statement um, in regards to it was, New Hampshire has a proud tradition of responsible firearms stewardship, and I've long said that I'm not looking to make any changes to our laws. This bill will ensure that New Hampshire's law enforcement efforts will be on our own state firearms laws, and that's where I believe their focus should be. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so essentially, kind of a, Sanctu like sanctuary, I guess you could kind of call it, like Bill in nature, but like it's yeah. really just to keep from our law enforcement agencies enforcing any kind of federal gun control. Yeah, is essentially what it is. The next, the next step to that, in my opinion, would be preventing federal agents from entering the state and enforcing laws. Yeah, but that that's kind of extreme for some people, but I think that's necessary. Because um, a lot of the, like the other side of this is local law enforcement state law enforcement we're not federally um sworn officers yeah so we're not able to enforce federal law it's got, yeah so this is kind of just like a safeguard where if for some reason uh local agencies were sworn by federal agencies i don't know um it's weird it's kind of like a preemption kind of thing It'd be almost like if the atf rolls up like they're the only ones that can do anything, you know what yeah. I mean, in their own regard. Yeah, which it's it's very good that it's still passed, because now it's explicit that state and local law enforcement will not enforce federal gun laws. Um, it, it's great to hear, um, although it's kind of already said, I think, through how we get our uh, jurisdiction over laws. So, yeah. like, for instance, if you're a town cop, you enforce laws in that town. If you're a yeah. state, you have jurisdiction over the state and actually deputies have the most um, jurisdiction in the state yeah well don't fish and game officers i think they fall under like state they get yeah. technically have jurisdiction over the whole state but the way the laws are written in new hampshire deputies have the most jurisdiction oh okay gotcha it's just gotcha. how it's written just how oh, it's written works. yeah yeah which is weird you know but i feel like there's definitely places in which like there's federal gun control like enforced you know what i mean like on a local and state level and it goes kind of, you know, uninterrupted. Like, I feel like if more federal gun laws were to come down, then you'd start to see more kind of local yokels starting to uh, try to enforce those. So I could see where the safeguard's coming from. Yeah, if you, you know? saw, if for instance, if this if this federal gun control package included in the sole weapons ban, for instance, or magazine ban of no more than 10 rounds or something, I could definitely see some local cops that don't care about the Second Amendment whatsoever, or even state cops, that might be like, oh, you're not allowed to have that and start confiscating stuff. Yeah. Uh, they might confiscate it and then uh, refer the case off to the feds. Which is, I wonder if that means then even the locals can't even refer it to the feds if they see something. 
being that they can't enforce it. I would say if they can't enforce it, I don't think they would. About it, they wouldn't uh, be able to report it. I would say if they can't enforce it, they shouldn't be confiscating property. At oh, a, at a minimum. That, at least, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about... At that point, they're enforcing it. I don't know about the, ref, uh, the, the referring to other agencies. It It'd fun. be nice if it also included, like, we can't assist federal agencies in enforcing federal gun laws. That's right. That would be awesome. Where That'd it's like, cool. okay, the ATF's here to, like, charge this guy for, like, sawing off a shotgun. It's like, okay, well, we can't help you, so... Your little, fun. Your little yeah. ragtag team ATF agents can deal with it. Like, yeah, get back, you know? Yeah. Like, for sure. Because it definitely, the, like, my interactions with the ATF have, they definitely rely on local law enforcement to assist them because they only have so many resources. Yeah. There's not that many federal agents compared to how many people there are, um, and let alone um, how many cops there are. Like, there's far more stay in local law enforcement than there are federal agents. Um, there's actually very, a very small number of federal agents overall. Hmm. So that's kind of one of the reasons um, they've been pushing to expand the federal agencies. And I actually did see, I, I didn't get a chance to verify this, but I did see that in this new federal gun control bill, they were giving some extra funding to like the FBI. Uh, hmm. Quite a, quite a bit of money, actually. I think it was like a, it was in the millions. Um, so... There's potentially some room <laughs> for some expansion here. Um, and then if you want to believe into some of the, the conspiracies and stuff that the FBI uh, potentially knows about some of these um, shootings and doesn't get involved soon enough. Um, kind of like some of the issues we have with 9-11. Yeah. Where agencies knew about stuff but didn't communicate with one another um, and didn't, didn't do as much as they could have done. So, uh, yeah, just definitely one of those things uh, to keep, keep your eye on. But... Yeah. Sure. New Hampshire's doing great overall, federally, as far as uh, the Senate, um, well, U.S. Congress, so the Senate and the House, and the President, not so great, and then the Supreme Court's doing great as far as the Second Amendment goes, so. So, yeah, it's kind of push and pull. You know, we got some, winning some, losing some. Yeah. But it's better than losing all, you know? Yeah. So, I, I'm, I'm sure there's definitely going to be some lawsuits coming forward about this federal gun control. Hopefully... This is the last we hear about it for a little while um, because midterms are coming right up. And I think that's part of the reason why this federal gun control got pushed kind of when it did. Because uh, the Democrat Congress people want to show their constituents that they're trying to do something about guns. And then the Republicans are trying to find, they're trying to walk on that line between what can I get away with passing while not losing all my hardcore pro gun votes. Yeah. yeah. And if anybody that's paying attention to this stuff, they should have lost all that support by this point. Yeah, m most definitely. So. Yeah. Well, overall, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Uh, more of like a what's up in the 2A kind of a news-oriented episode. Uh, we've had a few of those recently, and that's just because it's one of those. Yeah, because, well, there's so many things to, that just kind of came up out of nowhere that we had to talk yeah. about it, you know? Yeah. For sure. Um, especially, like, the New Hampshire stuff. We try to keep you guys updated on that. And yeah. I've been posting um, snippets of that stuff here and there on Instagram, um, on stories. Uh, so we actually, I got this information from uh, New Hampshire Armed Citizen Facebook group. So if you guys aren't a part of that, I'd recommend jumping on there. There's occasionally some good information in there. And one of the representatives um, from New Hampshire was actually the one that posted about this. He was the guy that, he was actually the, uh, the author of both of these bills. Yeah, uh, I think it was John Burr. Name drop him real quick. If I got I that, it, I believe it was. If I got that correct. Um, um, John Burt. Burt. Yep. John okay. A. Burt. So unfortunately, um, Goffstown or Weir in Deering. Yeah. Yeah. So more. Yeah, that part of the state. So I, I did unfortunately hear that he is retiring soon. So I don't think he's rerunning. Uh, he's been a really staunch supporter of the Second Amendment, which is great. Uh, so hopefully somebody replaces him that does the same. But uh, we appreciate what you've done, and um, we hope you guys like this, like I said. So if you guys um, want to support us, go ahead and follow us on Instagram, nh underscore 2a underscore on Instagram. Facebook, just plain old nh2a. We also have an email for questions, comments, concerns. That's nh2a podcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube. Finally caught up on YouTube videos. Uh, so the plan for that is the video on YouTube will come out a week after the podcast. And if you want to stay up to date with the YouTube videos, then I would recommend heading over to our Patreon, which is also NH2A. Um, we're going to post up our 
YouTube videos one week ahead up on Patreon. So you guys can get early access to those. Uh, all that money from Patreon goes right back into the podcast. Just trying to give you guys better content. Doesn't line our pockets. Yeah, most definitely. And now uh, time for my spiel. First of all, be proficient. Um, get out there. Train. You know, <clears throat> if you don't know what you're doing, find somebody who doesn't know what you're doing and shoot with them. And uh, train with them and, you know, learn what you need to learn. Um, the proficiency is all part of it. Um, when it comes to, you know, keeping an eye on what's what's going on on federal level, trying to keep a... Uh, Keep aware of what the climate is in your country or in your state or in your kind of local area um, so you can kind of have an idea of what's going on around you. And um, obviously, second of all, be politically active, more of uh, what this this episode was touching on. Um, seeing what's going on at a state and a federal level and at the Supreme Court um, is, is important because um, if you don't know, uh, you're not going to be able to get out there and let your opinion be heard and, um, and reach out to your elected officials when the time comes. Um, but normally, uh, like always, if uh, something's kind of up in the air at the moment, there's normally some kind of link someone can send you or some way you can find a way to uh, even fast fill in an email, even a generic email to your local representative. So keep an eye out for stuff like that. Um, and obviously, there's no reason you can't call the state house and let them know how you feel or the governor's office. Um, and then finally, again, be polite, be a good person, be the kind of person the community community like to have you as a part of. Um, that's always important, especially when there's a lot of people on the fence right now. They see these shootings. They don't know what's going on. They're afraid. They're nervous. And the best thing you can do is be as reasonable as you can, be as calm as you can, and try to, try to just explain things with logic and reason. And um, try to understand where these people are coming from as well. Um, they might not understand exactly how a lot of this stuff works, and that's why they're afraid. Um, it comes down to people like you or us to be able to try to connect with these people and Hear, hear what they have to say, but um, try to explain, you know, what's going on from our perspective, maybe from a more well-educated in that subject perspective, you know. But anyways, guys, um, we'll see you next time for 1.30. Take care. Uh, yeah.